You've probably seen logic gates like AND, OR, and NOT in textbooks, but have you ever stopped to ask, why do we even study them? Well, these tiny circuits are the foundation of something massive, computer memory. From registers to cache to RAM, every piece of memory in your computer is built using these fundamental gates. In this video, we're going to start with the basic logic gates and then build our way up to SR latches, flip-flops, and registers. But we won't stop there. We'll break down the basic memory architecture, showing how memory cells are organized into arrays with row and column decoders, and how this structure forms the foundation for RAM and cache memory. Plus, we'll break down the difference between edge triggering and level triggering circuits and why it matters. Quick reminder, watching is great, but building is even better. Use free tools like Logisim, Digital, or any circuit simulator of your choice to follow along. As you watch, try recreating the circuits step by step. Before we build a register, let's quickly go over the logic gates we need. First, we have an OR gate. The OR gate follows a simple rule. It outputs 1 if at least one of its inputs is 1. Otherwise, it outputs 0. Next, we have a NOT gate, which inverts the input. 1 becomes 0, and 0 becomes 1. When we combine the OR and the NOT gates as shown here, we have a NOR gate. The NOR gate outputs 1 only when both inputs are 0. Otherwise, it outputs 0. These types of logic gates are called combinational circuits because they depend only on the current input and not on the past inputs. Now, here's an interesting question. If logic gates are purely combinational, meaning they only react to current inputs, how do we get a circuit to remember something? Think about it. If a circuit's output only depends on its inputs at that moment, what's missing? What if we were to feed the output back into the circuit? Could it then store some value over time? If we take two NOR gates and connect them as shown here, we have an SR latch. This type of circuit is called a sequential circuit because the output of the circuit now depends not only on current input, but also on previous output or the previous state. In this SR latch, each NOR gate's output depends on the output of the other NOR gate. Let us look at how this feedback mechanism allows the circuit to remember its state. When S equals 1 and R equals 0, the latch stores a 1 in Q and Q bar becomes 0. In this state, the latch is said to be in a set state. When S equals 0 and R equals 1, the latch stores a 0 in Q and Q bar becomes 1. In this state, the latch is said to be in a reset state. Now here's the interesting part. When both S and R equals 0, there is no change in the output. The latch keeps the last stored value, acting as a simple memory unit. So we've built a circuit that can hold a value, our first step toward memory. But wait, we've also introduced a new problem. When both set and reset are 1, the outputs Q and Q bar are both 0. That shouldn't happen. Q and Q bar are supposed to be opposites. This is a serious problem because if our SR latch enters this state, it becomes unstable and can't reliably store data. So how do we fix this? The D latch solves the problem by replacing S and R with a single input, D. This ensures that the latch always receives a clear instruction, either store 1 or store 0, eliminating the possibility of conflicting inputs. The D latch has one data input, one control signal called enable, and two outputs. The first input D controls what value we want to store, the control signal, enable, controls when the latch stores the value from D. In many cases, enable is driven by a control signal from another part of the circuit, such as a microcontroller, CPU, or memory controller. The D latch has two outputs. Q is the stored value, and Q bar is the inverted stored value. Now how does the D latch works? When enable equals zero, the latch ignores the D input and holds on to its last stored value. In other words, it remembers its previous state. When enable equals 1, the latch immediately follows the D input. If D is 1, Q becomes 1. If D is 0, Q becomes 0. This removes the ambiguity of the SR latch and ensures a well-defined behavior. But wait, we still have one critical problem. Let's take a closer look at the relationship between the inputs and the output. This is the enable signal. It has two states, low and high, as shown here. When the enable signal is high, the D latch continuously follows the input, meaning the output changes immediately based on the input. When the enable signal is low, 
the latch stores the last input value and ignores any further changes. Now, if the input contains noise or unwanted fluctuations while the enable signal is high, the output will also capture those fluctuations, leading to incorrect or unintended values as shown here. These circuits are known as level-triggered circuits. In these circuits, the output continuously updates as long as the clock signal stays at a specific level. Therefore, they are prone to unpredictable updates and glitches in fast-changing systems, and that is why level-triggered circuits are not ideal for stable data storage. This lack of control is why we prefer edge-triggered circuits. In edge-triggered circuits, the output changes only at a precise transition of the clock signal, ensuring that data updates only at a single moment, preventing unintended changes, and ensuring stable, predictable behavior. A D flip-flop captures data only at the rising edge of the clock, ensuring stable and predictable operation. It is built using two D latches in a master-slave configuration, which allows it to function as an edge-triggered device. The first D latch is called the master latch. This latch is enabled when the clock is low. It captures the input value but does not yet pass it to the output. The second D latch is called the slave latch. This latch is enabled when the clock is high. It takes the stored value from the master latch and transfers it to the output Q. The final output only updates on the clock's rising edge, ensuring edge-triggered behavior. In other words, a D flip-flop copies D to Q on the rising edge of the clock and remembers its state at all other times. This prevents glitches and ensures synchronous operation, making the D flip-flop a stable memory element. And this is where things get exciting. By combining multiple D flip-flops, we can store more than one bit at a time. A register is formed by combining multiple D flip-flops, each storing one bit of data. For an n-bit register, we use nd flip-flops, all sharing a common clock signal. When the clock edge occurs, typically the rising edge, all flip-flops simultaneously capture and store their respective input bits, allowing the register to hold an n-bit value. This synchronized operation makes registers essential for storing data, buffering information, and enabling efficient data transfer inside a CPU. Now that we have seen how to build a register, let's turn our attention to the cache memory and RAM. In a computer, memory is an organized grid of tiny storage units called memory cells. When the CPU wants to read data, it sends an address through the address bus. The address is sent to the row decoder and the column decoder. The row decoder translates this into a specific row, activating the corresponding word line in the memory grid. The column decoder has a dedicated bit line. The bit lines connect these cells to the read-write circuit, allowing us to read specific bits in the selected row. The same procedure is followed to identify the correct memory cell when writing data. Then, the read-write circuit applies a voltage to specific bit lines, flipping the bits from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0 as needed. This basic memory architecture is fundamentally how all memory is built. The key difference lies in what type of memory element is used and how the access speed and power efficiency are optimized. Static RAMs use six transistor cells. It is faster, and no refreshing is needed. However, it is larger and more expensive. These cells are used for cache memory because of their high speed. On the other hand, dynamic RAMs use a capacitor and a transistor per bit. It is more compact and cheaper than SRAM, but needs constant refreshing. These cells are used as the main memory because they provide a balance between size and speed. Now you know how logic gates come together to build memory, but we're just getting started. Memory is only one part of the bigger picture. Make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss the next video.